Great, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to our second five on five referee webinar. Uh, it's good to see so many of you on here today. And uh, we're very lucky to have Albert Joseph, our Oceania referee manager, who'll be taking us through uh, this webinar today. Uh, the presentation will be available uh, to everybody uh, after the webinar is over. We, we are also recording it. Uh, so this will be a great resource for you to share with your colleagues as well. So uh, with questions, uh, at the end of Albert's presentation, if you can please, well, as soon as you have a question, if you can start to send it through the chat, uh, which is at the bottom, uh, if you can send them through to me, um, at the end of Albert's presentation, we'll be able to ask those questions. So without further ado, um, I'd like to hand you over to Albert Joseph. Uh, thanks, Andy, and welcome, everybody. And thanks very much for the opportunity to be able to uh, talk to you today. And uh, the topic uh, that we're going to go through today is conflict resolution. And uh, uh, for me, it's a very uh, pointed uh, topic because we are finding more and more that referees are having difficulty in identifying and also dealing with conflict. And in the main, most referees would prefer to ignore it and hope it goes away. Uh, but unfortunately, as basketball referees, we can't do that. So um, before I start, um, if I start to talk a bit too fast, if you can send Annie a message and, uh, and tell me to slow down, then Annie will let me know to slow down. Um, uh, or if there's any, as Annie said, if there's any questions or comments you'd like to make, please send them via the chat immediately um, because then it gives us an opportunity to make sure they're addressed as opposed to waiting to the end and you forget and then we miss out on it. So, all right, conflict uh, resolution. Um, Today, we're going to go through what is conflict, um, when to expect it, understand why conflict is occurring, and then if it is occurring, how do we recognise that conflict? And then lastly, what are some of the, for want of a better term, tips and tricks in dealing with conflict as a basketball official? So uh, normally in an interactive audience, I would ask those that uh, um, people in the audience whether they've ever experienced conflict and mostly everybody puts their hand up. Um, when I ask whether or not you've expected conflict, some people put their hand up. And uh, when I ask, how did you deal with it? Little amount of people put their hand up. So hopefully once we get through all of this, uh, perhaps a better understanding of it all and the processes might help us to deal with it um, in a better way as we go forward. All right, so what is conflict? One second as I just move that screen out of the way. Um, so in the basketball world, there are various types of conflict and conflict is not necessarily always bad. Uh, it can be. Um, in the main bad, we tend to think of it as bad, uh, but there's all types of different um, conflicts. So we have physical abuse. We've seen that on the court before. We have verbal abuse, but non-verbal abuse. We have accidental or intentional contact. Um, this is, is still conflict. Uh, then we have differences of opinion, and that's probably one of the biggest areas that as referees or officials we come to deal with. Um, also uh, administrators and supervisors of the game when we're talking to people uh, who are a little bit agitated uh, it's generally because there's differences of opinion uh, then we have general behavioral uh, conflict and, and we'll drill down into some of these as we go and then we've got a contest between players and coaches and players and players and coaches and coaches um, and this type of conflict is not necessarily bad as i mentioned it's what we call healthy competition, but still it leads into a conflict. So, uh, and it's something that we need to be mindful and aware of. This is an excellent uh, chance for me now to have my computer seize up on me. Oh, here we go. 
So um, now, when will they occur? Um, we always say to referees, um, administrators of the game, table officials and the like, that you should expect it. And the reason we say you should expect conflict, because it's a, it's a natural human phenomena that there's going to be conflict when you have so many people in, in a confined environment. So um, to say conflicts are inevitable, well, that's, that's just the reality uh, of a basketball game. Um, you're dealing with very spirited people. You've got 10 players who are playing with passion and commitment. So when's it, when is it going to occur? It's going to occur all throughout the game. And there are various scales of it. So it's really important for us to understand that it is going to occur. And if we can accept that, then it's much better for us to say, okay, what's our plan to deal with it? And that's really the core of what we're trying to um, present to you today is conflict will occur, here's my plan. And a better preparation gives us the best opportunity um, to identify and deal with it. And, um, and, and that's really the necessary part of our business as referees um, and as administrators of the game. So ultimately, our job is to make sure the game is played fairly within the spirit and intent of the rules and to separate the parties so that that can keep going on in that fashion. So uh, I've got a note down the bottom here. Will, 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 will we be able to please everyone all the time? And, and the short answer to that is no. We're not going to please everybody all the time. And we're not going to please everybody to their own satisfaction. What we are trying to do, however, is um, come to a, a, a pleasing or an amicable position that allows us to continue on with the game. Because we go back and we talk about what was differences of opinion, the differences of opinion that have been built on what people saw or heard from different perspectives and different angles. And of course, wherever we are on the court, we're going to get a different perspective and a different angle. So talking about why some of these conflicts uh, occur, and, and, and this is the part where I talk about, sometimes it's healthy, sometimes it's not. Um, and we have to have a process of intervening in behavioural um, aspects as opposed to interfering with those aspects. So players, we have different personalities. We've got very laid back players who nothing will really upset them. And then you've got people from the other end of the spectrum who um, any little uh, situation in a game um, may, uh, may cause them to explode. And What's important about that is we are not referring robots. We are referring people and the people who play the game are people with multiple different personalities along the way. So, so personality, this person might have one type of personality, the next person might have another type of personality and, and so forth and so forth. Not everybody is the same. So we can't expect to treat everyone the same. We have to, um, yeah, adjust our attitudes towards the personalities of people. And I, and I think that's the key. And, and the same it goes for the personalities of table officials, of referees, administrators, and supervisors. We all have different personalities and we can't expect that um, everyone's personality is going to be the same as, as ours is not either. Um, competitiveness is a big one. Um, some people have an, a win-at-all-costs attitude and whatever it takes, whether that be gamesmanship or the like, they're there to win. And, and by doing so, sometimes um, they, they fall into the world of conflict because the conflict helps them win. And, and the conflict uh, that, that is generated is because of their passion and commitment and the like. But it's not necessarily with an intent that they're trying to do something wrong. It's just that the competitiveness takes over and they're really intent on trying to win the game. So, um, next one's natural reactions and that's a really good one. You, you see it all the time. Somebody misses an easy shot um, and they naturally react. Um, this is generally uh, an element of disappointment in themselves 
uh, or the situation and not necessarily about other people. And it's really important to distinguish the difference between what is a natural reaction and what is it, you know, somebody trying to abuse somebody else uh, or a disputing of a call or something like that. So a natural reaction is, is very much a part of the game. And, um, and whilst it's done in a controlled fashion, it's all, it's all good. And I think that provides a really good element to the entertainment of the game. Um, it's not something that we should be putting a damper on unless it crosses the line. So uh, I mentioned gamesmanship a little bit earlier. Um, when you have uh, two players uh, playing, um, say, for example, I, I remember um, when we were refereeing a game, there was two players who were vying for the point guard spot in a state team. So what they were doing was, was trying to put each other off. There was a little bit of um, trash talking. There was a little bit of normal talking. Uh, there was a, you know, a little bit of um, non-verbal cues uh, against each other to try and put one off their game so that the other one can progress and be selected onto the state team. Um, you need to do your research around the players who are playing and, and what it means for them. And, and gamesmanship is a really, really big point. Um, and, and it's something that even coaches do. Um, you know, we've had plenty of situations in games where uh, coaches have generated conflict um, in, in any manner of ways in order to motivate their team. Um, so this is something that needs to be uh, considered as well. I think I'll talk about that a bit later as well. Um, I've written in this slide here, the internal and external pressures of a team. And I think that's really, really important to understand because at the end of the day, players remain as human beings as like we are. We all have our own separate baggage. We all uh, come from our homes or our other environments wherever we've come from, from work. We have our work stress, we have our family stress. Um, you know, if we've had an argument with our partner, all of these things carry on and then come into a team environment. And, and these are the sort of things that can additionally put some uh, pressure on players to cause them to um, act out and also um, to show elements of conflict. So, and lastly for the players, there is uh, the expectation. So if every player thinks they are a Michael Jordan of basketball and uh, they score 40 points every game, then the expectation is that they'll score 40 points every game. And when they don't, then there is a good chance there's going to be some conflict by that player because things are just not going their way. They're not hitting their shots and the like. They're, being subbed off, they're on the bench, they're coming back on, you know, and they're trying to prove what is expected of them. And sometimes it works well and sometimes it doesn't. But then this is a very much a, a potential source uh, of conflict for players. So. Um, this is uh, for coaches, and, and it's really important that we understand that there's uh, going to be conflict with coaches as well. Um, Again, go back to what I said about we're looking at things from different angles. Um, but at the, higher, at the higher level, we have to understand that coaches are uh, contracted coaches. Uh, their contract has uh, performance-based criteria in it. Uh, for example, the win-loss ratios and the like. So they're out to try and win as many games because that's their job. They're, they're fighting for survival of their job. And it's really important that we understand how much effort, commitment um, and um, dedication goes into their job so they can try and win. So there then becomes disappointment when there's a loss. And then that loss compounds, that emotion compounds into game after game if there's multiple losses. And, and, and then that could also be a source of um, conflict that is acted out towards referees or table officials, when not necessarily they're the reason for it, but they're just the brunt of it. And, and that's important for us to understand that sometimes uh, as, as officials, technical officials, 
have done nothing wrong, but these underlying issues are the ones that cause the conflict. Um, coaches act as the conduit of information uh, between the team and the officials. Uh, sometimes they can poke and prod and sometimes they can be quite cheeky, but that's their job. And their job is to keep referees on their game. Their job is to seek answers for their players. And because they're the conduit of communication, if a player has asked, uh, asked a question of the coach and the coach asks it of the referee, well, they're expecting an answer. So if answers are not coming, then they can get quite antagonistic and, and they might continually prod you. So we come back to a communication issue there. Um, motivating the team. This is something that I mentioned earlier. Sometimes coaches will act differently to motivate the team. And, uh, and we also have to understand this is not directed at the referees necessarily. This is gamesmanship. This is part of their job uh, to inspire uh, their players and the like. And we have to be able to see through a lot of that as well. Um, and the last one I'll just talk about here for coaches is what I call attribution assimilation. Um, and if particularly because of the pressure that sits on, on coaches. Um, if they are losing games or things are not going their way, they need somebody to blame. And, uh, and that's normal. And that's normal human behaviour, not just for coaches, but for human beings in general. And a very good example about that, and, and, and I'll let you think about this as I talk about it, is you're at work or you're at home um, and you do something really, really well. And then you start to tell people, oh, look, I did this and I did that. And, you know, and this is what I produced. Um, I won the game, you know, and so forth because everything went well. But when things go not so well, as a normal human reaction, we tend to blame something else. For example, my car didn't start. That's why I came in late for work. Uh, I kicked my toe. Uh, it was a bit sore, that's why I never scored my 50 points in the game. And we start to look for all the other reasons as to why things didn't go so well, as opposed to looking at our own performance. And this is really important also for referees to consider because if they don't have a good game, we are looking for all the reasons as to why they don't have a good game, which is generally not their own performance. And, and that's that piece of self-reflection and the like. So when you see a coach, a player, another referee, your partner, acting out in this way, understand that this is normal human behavior, but also understand that's the reason why it's happening. And then it's easier to deal with as well. Um, I've added this in because uh, we are all refereeing games in, uh, in stadiums that are crowded with lots of spectators. Uh, mums and dads following their kids uh, to the to the gym for their games and and you know we have to understand that there is also a source of conflict with spectators and whilst I always say that it's not our job to be involved and in trying to deal with that conflict we have to be aware of it. So, uh, thank you, buds. Whoever Buds is, thanks very much. Um, so what we want to try and do here is, is have a really good understanding that spectators will always be biased based on the performance of their, their child or the person they're supporting. They'll also be biased against their, their team for their team. So they're always going to have a, a view that is going to cause conflict regardless, you know. So if a child is playing in the team and they miss 70 shots, that's because the referee never let them, you know, get right to the ring and, and, and put the ball in the ring or whatever, or their teammates never pass them the ball. Or There's all these different reasons as to why, and then they get a bias up, and that can be a source of conflict as well. So um, we just got to understand that that's, that's the cause of the conflict. It's not for us to deal with it. Uh, or anything like that, but it is important for us to understand that all these other factors happen. Um, and, and when we get to spectator um, conflict, we, we generally use the administrators and the supervisors 
in, in dealing with that conflict. All right, so why does it exist? Um, mainly it exists uh, because we let it. So as technical officials in a game, um, and we've got plenty of examples where it's happened, uh, we allow conflict to occur, we allow conflict to continue, we allow conflict to escalate, and then we allow conflict to dominate the game. And we have to know what parts of that conflict we have to um, intervene in so that it doesn't happen. And again, our job is to provide an environment for everybody to play in a fair, um, in a fair way so that the right team um, wins. And if conflict exists, one way or the other, we need to get involved and we need to do that early. So, you know, the causes of conflict from a refereeing perspective is when, as referees, we make mistakes, uh, when we don't know the rules, when we apply incorrect penalties, when we don't have consistent decision making, where a foul at one end is not a foul at the other end, or three seconds at one end is not a three seconds at the other end, uh, not understanding the applicability of the advantage disadvantage rule, um, and not um, being able to communicate that type of stuff. So, you know, for the last couple of years, we've been talking a lot about verbal support. Every time you blow a whistle and there's a signal, we want you to verbally support it. Whilst we use these terms of verbal support, all we're trying to say is we need you to communicate your decision. And if you uh, communicate your decision, this generally stops a lot of conflict right from the start because a lot of people don't know what you called or what your decision is. And for that reason, they uh, then have a bit of conflict um, and then we're trying to then sort that conflict out. Um, the outcome of, of the conflict is generally frustrations and that's everybody involved. And we've all been um, a part of the game where we're seeing you know, the officials, uh, you know, whether they're the referees or the table officials, the players, the coaches, the spectators, all getting frustrated. We're seeing stress levels rise and then we start to see the outcome of all of that. And it's really important for us that we don't, we don't allow that to continue to escalate. So the big tip with conflict is once you've identified it, then go forward and start to deal with it. Don't let it escalate. Okay, so recognising uh, conflict. Generally, the easiest way to do it is you start to see some behavioural changes. And whether that starts with mild facial expressions, whether it starts with the hands being thrown up in the air or put out and, um, and then the hands taking over the mouth in terms of language, um, so a whole lot of gestures and, and the like, whether the tone uh, and volume of the voice is starting to rise and escalate, whether we're starting to see people dancing up and down the court, you know, because they're frustrated, all of these things are signs of conflict. And when we start to see that, we're asking you as uh, officials to get involved, confront the conflict early and deal with it. Again, by dealing with it at whatever level is better um, than any inaction. So any action you take to address conflict is better than any inaction you, you don't take because then it just escalates. So we're asking you always to just to get actively involved. So uh, again, from coaches, there's pretty much the same. You start to see player coach behavior is, is generally the same, but it, it's really important for you as officials to see that, um, recognize it, and then have a discussion about it. And that's, that's really critical. And I won't go into the spectator stuff again because we've, we've had that conversation already. But um, when we start to deal with conflict, um, it is really important that right from the start, um, particularly if it's a player or a coach, that you know the rules. You know what you're talking about. And a lot of times we have seen uh, officials go forward and start talking about um, a rule interpretation and they have it wrong. A lot of these coaches 
uh, a lot of these players are either ex-referees or technical officials or commissioners or have been uh, players who just know the rules inside and out. And it's important for us to be very familiar with the rules, know the rules to give the answer. And if we give the answer that is correct, then we won't cause more conflict. If we give an incorrect answer and, and the player or the coach knows it's incorrect, we're only just starting now again to build upon that conflict and we're going to get escalation. So first thing, know your rules and then communicate just the rules around it. Um, and that, and that's, that's the real key uh, towards it. The verbal support, again, is the communication. That is a major um, contributor to eliminating conflict from the outset. And we've done a lot of studies around that. So that's, that's really important. Use your voice, talk, your, talk through your signals, use preventative officiating. And then if you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a coach or a player, is doing, is doing that directly. Um, and, and again, providing that information. I always say that was a, as a tip, if you are gonna have a conversation with a player and a coach, don't do it face to face, stand on their side. So stand on you know, shoulder to shoulder, as opposed to face to face, because we don't really wanna create an environment that shows that we're trying to have an argument or it can contribute to an argument or you're in my face or something like that. So when we start to look at ways to um, dealing with it, just the very first stance is, is really important. And, and standing side by side means you're coming there in a non-conflict type of way and that you are only really resolving the issue at hand. And that's what you're trying to do. And you should be able to say that, excuse me, coach, what's the issue here? Okay, let's work out how we're going to solve this problem. And then start working through the problem. And in my slide, I say, try to achieve a win for all parties. It's not a 100% win, right? So if you walk away with a 50% win for you and a 50% win for the person, that's a win. And then everybody's generally satisfied, okay? So rather than trying to make it, well, I've made this decision, that's the only outcome and that's it. Well, let's work towards an amicable situation so that they feel like they've had a win. And the win could be, this is my decision. Now let me explain what it is. And, 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 the, and the explanation of the decision might be the win because the person can go, okay, I can understand how you got to that decision. And, and, and that might be enough. And, and again, if we want to talk um, conflict, we always talk communication with it because communication is the key to resolving all types of conflict. When you do so, um, as I said, where you stand is, is a big thing, but um, we, can't be, we can't be emotional about it. Um, uh, some of you may remember a few years ago, we had one referee in, in the Australian National League who approached a coach who had been riding in for the best part of the game and said, you can't treat, you can't treat me like a piece of shit. And, and that was communicated on the TV. It went worldwide. And that was... Um, you know, and that was where we say that you have to control your emotions. You can't control the emotions of somebody else. But that was a really good example of just the frustration had built up and that referee sort of acted out. And, and I always say, take a deep breath. Do not open your mouth and talk until you've taken a deep breath, let the air out, and then start to start to talk. And that will help you with your emotions. Uh, some other tips is it's, it's not an argument and it's not a contest to argue either. So if someone has a complaint, hear it, and then just work through a process of trying to deal with it so that again, we can try have a have a win-win. Um, um, active listening, what I say there is, uh, just make sure you're listening to what the issue is uh, and, and wait till the person's finished and then respond with the truth. We can't, we can't lie about our answer because people will automatically know um, when we lie. So the last slide, I won't go through it all, but there's just some tips and tricks, tips and tricks there for you to be firm and fair. And remembering that communication works two ways. It's not you talking down to somebody else and not you talking to somebody. It's always we are talking with. And the with part is an important part. So together you solve a problem. 
individually, it becomes a dictatorship and it's never going to work. So it's, it's two parties working together to solve issues and problems. And, and that's, that's probably the last um, tips and tricks um, that I can give you there. So, all right, is, is that about 30 minutes, Annie?